All right. Welcome everyone to another virtual shadowing session at Hearts for Health. Today we're joined by Dr. Cosgrove. She's the program director of the Yale New Haven Hospital School of Nurse Anesthesia, a clinical educator practicing CRNA at YNHH, and co-owner co and founder of Core Concepts Anesthesia Review LLC. As a quick reminder to those listening, to those who might be new to virtual shadowing, we have a Q&A saved towards the end to the last 20 or so minutes. So if you have any questions, type them in the chat and we'll go through them during the Q&A. For those who want to stay updated with future virtual shadowing sessions, follow us on Instagram where we post upcoming shadowing session flyers, or you can join us through our email listserv. To join, you can either subscribe on our website. At the very bottom of our page, we have a subscription form, just filling that out and submitting it. You'll be subscribed, or you can email us at shadowing.h, the number 4h at gmail.com with your name and email address so that you can be manually added on to the listserv. Again, for just more updates about our virtual shadowing sessions and other program announcements. With those reminders covered, Dr. Cosgrove, feel free to take it away. Hi everyone, thank you Michael for this opportunity to speak about the career of nurse anesthesia. Uh, I'm very excited about that. Um, I have been a nurse anesthetist myself uh, since 1990 when I graduated the Hospital of St. Rayfield School of Nurse Anesthesia in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, fast forward many years later, um, the Hospital of St. Rayfield School of Nurse Anesthesia was um, changed to the Yale New Haven Hospital School of Nurse Anesthesia where I am currently the program director and have been for approximately nine years. So um, I am passionate about the career of nurse anesthesia. I started out as a biology major on a pre-med track, uh, decided that it wasn't um, for me, uh, went to nursing school, uh, graduated nursing school, got onto a floor and said, wow, I think I've made a mistake. This was not what I signed up for at 2.30 in the morning with 36 patients under my care. Uh, so I began to look for something different, something uh, with more autonomy, uh, something uh, with a little bit more critical care. Uh, I became a uh, neonatal uh, intensive care nurse and I did that for about three or four years and then decided that I still needed to have a little bit more. And that's where I, I found nurse anesthesia. So uh, with that, that's my background. Um, I wanna share with you the history of nurse anesthesia. What is it that we do? How do we differ from anesthesiologists? How do we become a nurse anesthetist? So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, let's see. Um, I did have my Prezi up. I don't know where that is now. Um, desktop one, share. So let's see. And there we are. So hopefully you can see my screen at this point. Yeah, it looks all good. All right, and can you see certified registered nurse anesthetists? Yep. All right, excellent. So let's get started. Um, who are we? We are highly educated expert anesthesia professionals. Uh, we start out as registered nurses, uh, and then as you'll hear later on, what does it take to become a CRNA? You have to move from the regular floor type of nursing to some sort of critical care nursing. And you have to have at least a year of experience in critical care nursing. In fact, our program requires 18 months before you can even make application to a nurse anesthesia program. So something to think about. Um, Brief history of nurse anesthetists. Um, true or false, the nurses were the first caregivers to administer anesthesia in the United States. And I'm sure you can figure out where this might be going. Uh, the answer is true. Uh, believe it or not, uh, anesthesia was thought to be sort of uh, a subservience to the surgeon. And so it was the job of not another physician to give anesthesia to a patient, but to the nurses. Um, it was a poorly paid position, um, and the surgeons sort of handpicked their uh, nurses to give anesthesia to patients. And um, we actually uh, go back to the Civil War. Um, there is documentation of our first uh, nurse anesthetist, Catherine Lawrence. Uh, she is the first nurse to administer anesthesia. Um, in the Civil War, probably open drop ether, I'm thinking, uh, and she's buried in uh, New York, New York State. 
Um, the next nurse anesthetist we like to talk about is Sister Mary Bernard. Uh, she was credited as being the first nurse anesthetist, uh, although we know that anesthesia was given via nurses um, by Catherine um, in the Civil War. Uh, Alice McGaugh um, is known as the mother of anesthesia. This is uh, a pivotal woman who worked with the Mayo brothers uh, at the Mayo Clinic. They only wanted her or nurses to give their patients anesthesia. So, uh, and her journals are said to be amazing. And her uh, rate of success was very high, which was sort of unheard of in that day, because again, we were using open drop ether. We didn't have monitoring like we do today. There was no such thing as uh, measuring oxygen saturation with pulse oximeters, measuring carbon dioxide output uh, to be sure the patient was ventilating uh, and so on. And just dropping ether on top of someone's face on a little cheesecloth mask was a very sort of um, random way to give anesthesia. Um, you weren't giving uh, minute increments, uh, milliliters, milligrams, and so on. It was just going out there and you sort of crossed your fingers and hoped the patient did well. In 1909, Agnes McGee opened up the first nurse anesthesia educational program. Again, uh, up to this point, it was kind of the surgeon pointed you out and said, hey, want to come to the head of the bed and keep this patient asleep for me? Uh, and so there was no real um, uh, formal setting for nurse, nurses to be trained as nurse anesthetists. In 1929, Helen Lamb was an anesthetist that said, hey, we got to standardize this. We need some creds. We need some credibility. We have to have an exam. We have to have a certification process. And she was the uh, person responsible for the national certification exam which our graduates still take today before they are able to practice. Uh, Agatha Hodgins is a name that many people may have heard as being the mother of anesthesia. She's really not, but she's memorable because she was the person that got our first association together. Uh, that was the National Association of Nurse Anesthetists back in 1931. Uh, in 1939, uh, they moved forward and they changed it to the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. And then most recently in 2021, uh, we changed the name uh, to the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology. Why did we do that? Well, there is reason. Um, the silliest reason is anesthetist is very difficult to say, which for some of us, it's not. Uh, the next reason is there are another set of providers known as anesthesiology assistants. And anesthesiology assistants uh, do not have um, hands-on patient care before they enter their anesthesiology assistant programs. Uh, they come right out of college. They usually have the same prereqs as uh, you would for medical school. Uh, and then you go into a, uh, an anesthesiology assistant program, but you don't have the RN, you don't have the clinical uh, the critical care experience that RNs have before they enter a nurse anesthesia program. And they started to call themselves anesthetists. And the ANA felt that there were some uh, crossing of the lines. Uh, also, anesthetist means that you are a technician. Uh, anesthesiology or anesthesia is a technical thing. Anesthesiology is expertise in the field of anesthesia. So uh, it caused a lot of hullabaloo, I'll say that. And it's also caused uh, a little bit of a, uh, a chasm between the American Society of Anesthesiologists and the AANA right now. But we, we go through these peaks and valleys where we're, you know, we're friendly, we're not, we're friendly, we're not. So we're kind of in a weird phase right now. Um, in 1957, the first certification exam for nurse anesthesia was implemented finally. So Helen Lamb's uh, work finally came to fruition years later after she mentioned it. What do we do exactly? Um, I get asked a lot, what's the difference between me and an anesthesiologist? And really the only difference is that I took a different path. I did not stay in pre-med and go to medical school. I didn't do internship and residency. I went to nursing school. I got a bachelor's degree. I went back to school. I got a master's degree in biology with a specialty in anesthesia. 
And then later on, I went back for my doctor of nurse anesthesia practice, which is my clinical doctorate. So it's a little circuitous, but I am not an MD, I'm a DNAP. And then I went further and got a PhD in health related sciences. So um, not all CRNAs are required to have a PhD, but all CRNAs now, uh, all, all uh, trainees entering uh, nurse anesthesia programs will end up with some sort of clinical doctorate, as I'll uh, mention. Uh, we safely administer uh, approximately 33 million anesthetics per year in the United States. Uh, we give general anesthesia. We give conscious sedation. Backing up to the 33 million anesthetics in the United States, we are responsible for, as the sole practitioners, anesthesia practitioners, in about 85% of all of our rural critical access hospitals in the United States, uh, in the Midwest, for instance, uh, in the Deep South, and so on. Uh, you'll find many practices that have just nurse anesthesia um, for anesthesia services. Spinals and epidurals, we do those. Uh, we do peripheral nerve blocks, major nerve blocks, uh, especially in the uh, setting of the opioid crisis. We now are looking to uh, lighten up on the general anesthetic and somehow augment uh, the anesthesia so that the patient uh, doesn't feel a lot of pain. So we're becoming very expert in finding these neurovascular bundles of these major nerves, uh, numbing them and allowing the surgeon to do what he needs to do with our patient under a lighter plane of anesthesia using much less opioids. Uh, and that has been our sort of our, uh, our focus for the past few years, uh, secondary to this uh, horrible opioid epidemic we're going through. Uh, we place central lines for monitoring, for um, uh, provision of fluids, for rapid transfusion, uh, usually goes into the internal jugular vein. We also have clinics throughout the United States where we are practitioners in chronic pain management. And again, think of patients that don't have access uh, to uh, major medical centers. And you have a lot of people in rural USA who would have to travel three, four, 500 miles to get to the nearest major medical center. So we provide services and increase access uh, to patients who are having problems with chronic pain. Uh, we are experts in airway maintenance and rescue. I would say that's probably our most important role is uh, knowing and understanding the airway and how to open it and how to keep it open, even in emergency situations, how to create a surgical airway through the cricothyroid membrane. If we had to, we are trained in all of that. We work in a lot of healthcare settings, in hospitals, in freestanding surgery centers all through the United States, uh, in birthing centers. Uh, some of us work in ERs. Uh, many times we're called to the ER just for airway management. Uh, outer offices, dentists use us, plastic surgeons use us for office procedures. Again, we talked about the chronic pain treatment centers. Uh, on the front lines, the majority of anesthetics on the front lines are given by nurse anesthetists. Uh, primary caregivers during COVID-19 pandemic. And I want to focus on that for a second. Um, we, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the uh, early days where hospitals were literally shutting down, uh, not doing elective surgery cases, we were actually moved to the intensive care units. We functioned as um, respiratory therapists. We functioned as advanced practice providers. We were the people intubating these sick patients, putting in invasive lines and monitoring, uh, ordering their medical care. Uh, and we did that very successfully. And uh, in most states, we're still um, practicing without the need for any physician interaction with us. We can do all this ordering. We have prescriptive authority. And I believe that now there are 22 states in the United States that have actually opted out of medical direction for nurse anesthetists. So we are quite autonomous um, and very skilled at what we do. Here's a video that I like. It's about 11 minutes long.
Miss Emmeline, is it baby one or two for you? Baby two. You know where you're getting? The girl. The girl. You know, they always cause the most trouble. Right here. Once you get that blood pressure cuff on you, I want you to put your elbows in your lap. Good. Now drop a big deep breath in. Blow it out. Good. Drop your shoulders down. Put your chin on your chest. Wrap yourself right around your baby. Right around your belly there. Now I'm going to touch you with my cold hands. I do apologize for that. Their nurse anesthetists, like all nurses, care about their patients. What I love about being a CRNA is the autonomy and working with patients and being able to care for them from start to finish. They're not just thinking about how important it is for them to do their work competently and to carry out the procedure exactly as it's supposed to be carried out. But they're thinking about that individual person. Most patients, when they come in, they say the scariest part is the anesthesia. And we, when we're able to come in and talk to them, and we talk to them about anesthetic options and what we're going to do and you know, how we're going to meet them on the day of surgery, and just seeing that relief in their eyes, especially when they show up on surgery day and they see that same person they talk to in the pre-op, and they're like, oh, a familiar face, somebody that I, you know, that I trust and I believe in. You know, and it really has helped me to see how much pain changes people. And then when you can relieve that pain, it's, it's really rewarding. Try not to pull away. It does cause another poke. One, two, three. At the end of their procedure, when you're waking them up and they give you that look when they first wake up, they say, we're done. It's over. Yeah, it's done. It's just, just that, that easy. They're comfortable and happy and I'm happy. That is a success for me. Sometimes the only thing that gets rid of that pushing pain is pushing. Right. Okay. Do you have any questions for me? Give yourself some medicine. I want you to call Gail until you're going to do that, okay? Because it can drop your blood pressure just like We're a category of advanced practice nurse. And sometimes I think because we're behind closed doors, people really don't understand what goes on in an operating room. And so to say to them, well, if you've heard of certified nurse midwives or nurse practitioners, those are nurses that have gone for additional education and preparation to become an advanced practice nurse. And so I let them know that I'm like a nurse practitioner in terms of having gone for additional training, but that my additional education and skill preparation was in anesthesia. Rural communities have been very creative about the use of their workforce to meet the needs of their community. So they have uh, really looked at the types of resources that they can use to the full extent of their training and education to meet the needs of the community without busting the bank and trying to bring in provider types. There's less redundancy of services to when you can utilize CRNAs um, as a full service anesthesia provider. When you live in a community this small, you know everybody and everybody knows you. You go to the grocery store and the lady who checks you out, you did her anesthesia. Or you go to a restaurant for dinner and the lady who's waiting on you, you did her husband's anesthesia. About 80% of the land mass of Colorado is rural. 25% of the people live in the 55 sparsely populated counties leaving you know, 10 counties along the front range holding almost all of the people. So most of the state is rural and we need to have affordable and accessible health care. Nurse anesthetists help provide that for us. They can uh, manage a patient, stabilize a patient, uh, even if they're critical, uh, using the whole spectrum of techniques, including intubation techniques, uh, IV access techniques, uh, pain management techniques. My association with any interest in the CRNA group was when I was president of the State Board of Health, where I was served for over eight years. Early in my term, the question came up about having non-supervision of CRNAs. And I was somewhat against that idea because uh, I felt like they might, several board members felt like the CRNAs might overstep their 
uh, their purview and do pain management and so on. Since that time, I've gone 180 degrees in the opposite direction. I think the CRNAs we have at this hospital are providing the best anesthesia I have ever seen. We think of what we do as routine. We do it every single day and it can become very routine. But we remember as nurses that these patients that are coming for anesthesia is anything but routine for them. It could be their very first encounter with us, 10 minutes of time of meeting us and trusting us to deliver an anesthetic to them. So that nursing experience of being able to build relationships quickly has really benefited me in my practice as a CRNA. Okay, Ms. McDonald, we're all ready to take you back, okay? Are you good? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm gonna to start to give you some sedation, all right? That's gonna to start to make you feel kind of drowsy. If you don't remember the trip into the operating room, that's completely normal, okay? We're gonna take great care of you, okay? No worries. All right. I'm gonna fix your pillow. You start to just think good thoughts, okay? Under a general anesthetic, of course, the patient's rendered unconscious, but serving as their advocate that entire time is really the role of the CRNA, not just managing hemodynamics and fluid status and pain status and depth of anesthesia, but really being their advocate. So speaking for them to the entire team, because sometimes the operating room is full of providers, of reps from different companies for equipment, and so serving as their constant advocate, speaking for them, making sure they're safe and comfortable the whole time is really what we do. Tilt your chin up towards the ceiling. Perfect. And take three or four really big, nice, deep breaths all the way in, all the way out. Very tight on your left arm, okay? Just for a moment, gonna check your blood pressure, all right? Everything's perfect. I know it's terribly uncomfortable just the first time. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna give you a break, okay? We always say we have to be very obsessive compulsive. And um, I think that that shows every time you watch a CRNA do anesthesia because they have to have everything set up. They have to have their little nest made in the operating room so that they feel they have everything right where they can get to it on a moment's notice. It's a constant assessment. You know, in nursing school, we're, it's all about the assessment be it the emotional assessment, the physical assessment, whatever that is. And that's what I feel that as a CRNA, we have to do. It's an assessment of myself. It's an assessment of my equipment, of the patient, of the room equipment, maybe the lighting, the heating, the surgeon's beeper, the shoes that someone's wearing, whatever it is, it all has to be done. CRNAs, nurse anesthetists, are there for the entire case, the entire procedure. We are there to put them to sleep. We are there for the duration of the procedure, and we wake them up at the end, take them to recovery room, and then we do rounds later on and post off all of our patients to see if they had any concerns or any problems with the anesthesia. <laughs> Give you a little bit more pain medicine. They do a great job taking care of my patients. It's a partnership and taking care of them. And I understand their abilities. I think they uh, give a full spectrum of care uh, to patients and are um, uh, uh, highly skilled and able to uh, do what I need. That is to put patients to sleep and to take good care of them and wake them up and bring them successfully through an operation. I think the future of nurse anesthesia is very bright. And in light of the Affordable Care Act, we all know that there are a lot of patients that are gonna be needing healthcare that now will have health insurance, will have a way into the hospital. And I think nurse anesthetists are poised to provide this service. We're gonna to need to expand the scope of practice of nurse anesthetists and advanced practice nurses in general in order to meet the healthcare needs. And I think it's perfectly appropriate to expand that scope of practice as long as we have well-prepared, well-educated nurses who uh, can provide that care safely and competently and caringly as well. If I were still president of the Board of Health, uh, I would have voted now to authorize them to do whatever they feel competent to do. I love my job. I love it. It's very rewarding. I'm just in my element. I would never turn around and go back again. It's the most wonderful position that you can have, that you get to 
take care of patients and take them through some of the most difficult times that they have in a safe manner. Having that type of experience and that connection with patients has really, you know, brought it to the forefront for me. And that's what I love about being able to have that hands-on and that, uh, that close connection with patients. We're basically their voice, their, their advocate the entire time they're asleep because they can't speak for themselves. Um, so we're kind of their eyes and ears while the surgeon's performing on the other side of the tree. It's rewarding both professionally and personally, and you can't ask for much more than that from a profession. I think it's so comforting when I can say to a patient when I'm out there in the pre-op area before their surgery explaining what's going to happen. Hi, my name is Jennifer Herrenberg. I'm a nurse anesthetist. I'm going to be with you the whole time. You're in good hands. We'll take care of you today and everything is going to be okay. What I like to tell people is um, that I think nurse anesthesia is the best of both worlds. We are able to provide um, medical care uh, to uh, a very high level, yet we remember uh, what it's like to be a nurse and to be trained in that um, caring for the individual, caring for the person globally, worrying about uh, their, you know, um, their diversity, their, uh, their emotional status, um, um, hands-on, uh, just touching. I, I give Reiki to my patients. I'm a Reiki practitioner. And uh, if we have uh, a case where they're not going all the way to sleep, I uh, sometimes will give them Reiki to help calm them uh, if they're just under sedation. And so there's, it's, it's a more, I think it's, it's a very sort of um, holistic approach, if you will, uh, to anesthesia. So what does it take to become an anesthetist? Uh, the road is kind of bumpy. I'll, I'll say that it's these nurse anesthesia programs are very, very demanding. Uh, if you are thinking of applying to a nurse anesthesia program, if you're not quite in college yet, or if you are in college, um, strive for a high GPA. Uh, you want a strong background in the sciences. We look for a uh, science GPA of, about, of at least 3.3 or greater. Uh, you need to have a baccalaureate degree in nursing or in another health-related field. What we're finding out is a lot of people will go to a different career and then they'll say, you know what, I really want to be a nurse. I don't, I'm not finding gratification in my work. Um, for instance, I had a student come to me. She was a, a designer uh, for Calvin Klein living in New York City. Um, and I thought, wow, what a phenomenal job. Why is it that you're here applying to a nurse anesthesia program? She had actually left the profession, gone to an accelerated BSN program. There's lots of those out there. They take one year. You get an accelerated BSN. It's, it's grueling. It's brutal. But you're in and out the door in a year's time and then practicing as an RN. And she said, I didn't have meaning in my work. She said, it just, I mean, for I, I, when I really sat down and thought to myself, what do I do? I design clothes. So what? I wanted to have more of an impact um, and more meaning. So she followed that track and she today is a nurse anesthetist. So um, you don't have to necessarily start out as a registered nurse. You can go a more circuitous route. Um, you have to be an RN. Uh, you have to have no less than one full-time year, which is approximately 2,000 hours of critical care experience. It must be an ICU, either cardiothoracic, neuro ICU, trauma ICU, respiratory. Uh, I will warn you, if you like kids, if you like newborns, that's great. If you want to work in those ICUs, that's wonderful as well, but there are a lot of anesthesia programs out there that will not accept you for pediatric or neonatal ICU experience because they feel it's too much of a niche. I still accept those people because I'm one of those crazies, A, and B, I find that pediatric uh, practitioners are very, very detail-oriented Why? because you have to be. You know, you're working on babies that are less than a pound. Uh, so you can't kind of just wing it. So uh, I still like uh, pediatric um, uh, candidates. You have to be certified as a CCRN, critical care RN certification. It's an exam you take. You're not eligible to take that exam until you've at least worked 1,750 hours in a critical care unit, contiguous. 
Um, and demonstrable emotional intelligence. Well, what does that mean? Uh, we talk about grit. We talk about resiliency. Uh, these programs are now three years in length. All right. Not only are you paying tuition, but you're not able to work simultaneously. You have to sort of give everything up. So there's opportunity cost. You know, if you were making a hundred thousand dollars, ninety thousand dollars as an RN for three years, tack two hundred and seventy thousand dollars onto your tuition because that's the money you lost that you would have made. Um, it takes a lot of saving, a lot of planning, a lot of flexibility, maturity. Uh, and we look for that in our interview process. You know, tell me what you're, tell me, tell me something bad about yourself. That's one of my favorite questions. What was the last mistake you made? If, if there was something you could change about yourself, what would it be and why? Um, those kind of questions, difficult, out of the, out of the norm questions, you know. Um, once you want to become a nurse anesthetist, you attend an accredited nurse anesthesia program. Right now in the United States, there's approximately 120, 121 programs. Some programs did not move on to um, confer the doctoral degree. Now everyone entering a nurse anesthesia program will end up with a doctoral degree because the programs are three years long and um, so the graduation date for a doctoral degree, the need for a doctoral degree was 2025. So uh, the program numbers are in flux, but I think it's about 120 um, all over the United States, but they're clustered. Like there's certain states that don't have nurse anesthesia programs, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire don't have them. Rhode Island has only one, Connecticut has three. California only has two, which is weird for a huge state. Lots of places in the Midwest don't have programs. So you really have to kind of figure out, should I move? Can I move? Florida has nine programs. Uh, if you're listening in from Florida, you've got, you can swing a cat and hit a program. So that's good news for you. Uh, you're going to get a doctoral degree and it could be a doctor of nursing practice. If you're getting your nurse uh, anesthesia degree through a nursing program, we confer a doctor of nurse anesthesia practice. We are um, situated at Central Connecticut State University in the Department of Biology. So it's a very science-based um, degree. Uh, we also um, sort of focus on human factors, patient safety, which is exactly what my PhD is in. Uh, you can get a DNPA. You can even, there are some programs out there I think Rush in uh, Chicago is one of them that where you end up with a PhD in nurse anesthesia. And then you have to pass the national certification exam. Right now, the first time pass rate is about 84%. So after three years of intense studying, 16% of people do not pass that exam on the first try. It's pretty, um, pretty difficult. So uh, what's it like to be a student registered nurse anesthetist? It's a big transition, but a small transition. Because um, you'll have been practicing, you know, what you're going to be doing uh, in nine months. Then my time to shine. And that's when, once the patient is ready, I can intubate them, place any other type of airway, support them, um, keep them comfortable and safe during their surgery, and then make sure that they wake up and go to the post anesthesia care unit comfortable. The great thing is you get tons of experience in this program, um, get blocks, uh, get lots of regional techniques, spinals, epidurals, uh, peripheral nerve blocks. You get to work pretty autonomously throughout the program. They slowly just give you more and more. My experience here directly correlates with my success when I finish here. I am doing the job that I will be eventually getting paid for day in and day out. I wake up at 4.30 in the morning, I come here to the OR and I prep my cases and I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I would tell them to definitely pursue it, um, but you've got to be in it, you know, to 
you've got to be present. You've got to be um, willing to put in the hard work. It's not just a cakewalk. I would describe a nurse anesthetist as somebody that patients put all their trust into, whether that's in a pain clinic or making sure that they are feeling no pain and not remembering their surgery. It's your job to put them to sleep, keep them comfortable and, and wake them up. Provide my patients with the best anesthetic care that I possibly can. And I don't feel like it's work. I have fun, the people are great, and the job is wonderful. I feel very lucky to be in this profession. I was a critical care nurse, and I was comfortable taking care of sick patients, but I was not autonomous as a practitioner. And throughout this program, that's something that I have gained and is so valuable to me that. I'll be able to take with me as a new grad nurse and it's just by attending the ideal new human hospital school of nurse anesthesia we learn how to take someone's consciousness from them hold it for the duration of a medical procedure and then give it back to them at the end of the case um, it's really an interesting experience because at some point uh, once a person is unconscious they are unable to do all of the normal things that we take for granted that keep somebody alive. They can't, they can't breathe, they can't maintain their blood pressure. Um, and those are the things that we do for them, both mechanically, pharmaceutically, with interventions with our hands, with the drugs that we push, with the procedures that we do, knock them out, but keep them up. The most difficult part, I would say, is knowing that you have their lives completely in your hands. I definitely try to come off with like a warm, inviting smile. Um, it's, you know, you gotta establish that rapport in, you know, a matter of minutes or even seconds. So one of the main challenges of CRA in school is obviously the time commitment and the time that we have to put into everything that we do. Studying, uh, clinicals, and just, being in the OR is very, very time consuming. Most of the weekends we are either working on care plans, working on studying, prepping for tests, or prepping for any other part of the clinical aspect. I just want to say that the program obviously is uh, it's, it's very challenging. You know, I want to speak to how arduous it is almost, yeah. you know, um, how hard it is to be. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, the payout is amazing. Which is <laughs> okay. Yeah. Nurse and anesthetists are your anesthesia providers here every beat, every breath, every second. You're going to be off to sleep soon. We're going to take great care of you. See you in the recovery room. And those were my uh, nurse anesthesia students. Those are the classes of 2017 and 2018 together. So why should you consider a career in nurse anesthesia? Um, lots of different reasons. Uh, it's about as autonomous as you're gonna get as a registered nurse. Um, very, very high degree of job satisfaction and a low attrition rate. Uh, in my 31 years of practice, I have known two people that have left the profession, one to become a travel agent and one to be a contractor. Both of them were back in two years time, uh, back at the head of the bed giving anesthesia. It's just, um, I can't describe what a great feeling it is and how gratifying it is to be able to go into a room where someone is in labor and uh, place an epidural and 20 minutes later, she's uh, pain-free and her birth experience is a positive one. It's just, it's really amazing. Um, it's an honor to be with people on these special days of their lives that they'll never forget. I remember the day I had my gallbladder out. You know, I remember every surgery I've ever had. And those are pivotal experiences in people's lives. And we're there with them. And it's just amazing. Um, 
flexibility, scheduling, geographic location, lifestyle, your practice focus. Maybe you don't want to be a full-time call person. Maybe you want to work three twelves and have four days off a week. Uh, maybe you'd like to live in Colorado. Maybe you'd like to live in Florida. Maybe you want to be at one of those rural access hospitals in the middle of Texas, right? As a solo practitioner on your own. So there's a lot of choices out there. Maybe you want to focus only on pain. Maybe you want to be just an OB, an obstetric anesthetist, a pediatric anesthetist, a cardiac anesthetist. Those choices are all out there for you. Certainly, uh, you can uh, go into the armed forces as well. Um, I believe with a doctoral degree, you enter as, I want to say captain. I'm not 100% sure on that, though. Uh, very, very favorable salary and benefit packages uh, and a very high degree of pride in the profession. We have approximately 93% membership rate in our professional organization, which is one of the highest um, rates in the United States in any professional um, organization. So I did some research today. Uh, I went into the 100 best jobs uh, You've seen this U.S. News and World Report, the 100 best jobs of 2022. Um, and nurse anesthetist was number eight in best healthcare jobs out of 100, number nine in best paying jobs out of 100, number 10 in best science and technology jobs, and number 19 in 100 best jobs. So that's pretty high up there. Our overall score is a 6.9 out of a total of 10 points. How do they work that? The methodology is based on a score of a one to 10, obviously 10 being the highest on salary, unemployment rate, uh, 10 year growth volume and uh, 10 year growth percentage. Uh, that's to say in 10 years, how many more of you are we gonna need? And we are very high up there. Um, Work-life balance and stress level. I will tell you that the stress level uh, scored a little lower uh, than the others because clearly you uh, you have a patient's life in your hands. You're rendering them unconscious uh, for someone to go and cut them open uh, and do terrible things to them. And then uh, you wake them up at the end and you get them back breathing on their own and you hope that they're comfortable and not throwing up and so on. So there's a bit of stress, but a lot of us are sort of adrenaline junkies. So we kind of like it. Uh, otherwise, I don't think we would gravitate toward that. So something to think about right now, uh, the job market is wide open. I know my students, when they hit the clinical sites, from day one, they're getting um, recruited. Uh, come work for us. Come work for us. Come work for us. Everyone is really um, uh, looking, searching for anesthesia providers, both MD providers and CRNAs. Uh, we have a real issue um, out there. Uh, we're closing operating rooms because we don't have the staff. After COVID, we've had um, just a, a huge amount of RNs who have left the profession uh, or are leaving the profession. Um, and our nursing schools are understaffed so that people that want to be RNs are having a hard time even becoming an RN because they don't have the faculty available to teach them how to become RNs. So uh, certainly you're not ever going to be at, at a loss for employment if you become a nurse anesthetist. Where can I find more information about the career of nurse anesthesia? Well, you can go to www.aana.com, go to the member resources tab that you see down below and uh, go to become a CRNA from there. Uh, you'll hear, you'll read all about the history of, uh, you will see uh, the salaries of the CRNA. The median salary of a CRNA in the United States currently is about $183,000 a year. Please don't do this for the money. Right. Remember, you've got three years of anesthesia school. You are missing three years of work as an RN. Uh, so you're going to have a lot of loans when you get out. You, you've got to do it for the love of the profession. Um, this is a, a snapshot of the ANA um, website, which is great. 
Uh, this is the school that I uh, am in charge of, the Yamla Haven Hospital School of Nurse Anesthesia. If you want to know more about this program, you can uh, reach me, www.ynhhsna.com. And again, I'm Marianne Cosgrove. It's been a pleasure to speak with you. And I'm happy to take any questions that you might have about the profession or whatever it is. Well, thank you thank so much again, Dr. Cosgrove, for joining us and sharing all of those insights about nurse anesthesia. There was a lot that I learned personally. I'm sure that many of the audience can say the same. Our first question we wanted to go into is what your day-to-day -day life looks like. I know that probably is variable. There's probably a, a busy time being the program director and handling multiple positions, but what do you usually deal with day-to-day? Well, why don't I start with what my, I, I still do um, clinical anesthesia. I spend one day a week in the operating room just to keep my skills up, uh, to have some credibility with my students. I uh, can't really teach something if they don't see it in your scrubs and they, you know, in the trenches with them doing the same kind of work that they do. So if it's an OR day, I'm up at uh, about 530 in the morning. Uh, I get into the hospital around 630 in the morning because most cases start at around 730 in the morning. I go in, I set up my room, um, and you'll notice there's a lot of machinery, uh, the anesthesia machine, you've got a couple of views of it. Um, they're pretty intense in terms of dealing with them. You have to be very knowledgeable. You have to be sort of a techie, which is another piece of the job that I love. Uh, I like tinkering with things. And um, uh, so there's a checkout procedure that you have to do almost as if you were getting ready to fly a plane. Uh, we have a checklist of things that we have to check through and so on. We do all that. We set up for the case. Uh, we go out, we meet our patient. We start their intravenous. Uh, we establish a rapport with them. And usually we only have about uh, anywhere from 10, 15, 20 minutes with them to talk to them, get their medical history, uh, establish some trust. We bring them to the operating room. They do the procedure. Uh, I do eight hour shifts. Uh, because after the eight hours, then I'll go down to my office and play catch up all the emails that I've missed for the day. Um, many people do 10 hour shifts. Lots of people do 12 hour shifts. So uh, it's drop that patient off in the PACU, bring the next one back, put them to sleep, monitor them, uh, you know, intervene if they get into trouble and so on. Uh, the rest of it, uh, is my day-to-day -day life is it's like an office position and I do a lot of different things. I uh, teach a few of the 700 level classes. So I'm always preparing for lectures, um, uh, grading uh, papers, uh, case reports, um, editing doctoral scholarly projects. Um, it's pretty busy dealing with my, my boss and looking at our budget and making sure that that's in line and uh, but uh, overall, it's a very um, gratifying experience. The one good thing about being um, faculty and being a di director of a program is it sort of it sort of keeps you young. Uh, I'm always surrounded by uh, people in their late twenties, early to mid thirties. So, you know, um, I'm sixty, but I still think like a twenty five year old. I think. So, because I'm surrounded by all these people that think in that way. So I love it. Yeah, it definitely has shown through as a very gratifying and rewarding job. Um, next question we have is, you mentioned a lot about the history very early on in the 1800s behind nurse anesthesia, but between now and the last 20 to 30 years, how have you seen the profession change, particularly with technology? That's a great question. And I, that's one of the other great parts of being a nurse anesthetist is I'm doing things today that I would have never dreamt of doing 30 years ago. When we trained, we were not allowed to do spinals and epidurals. We had to hold the patient for the anesthesiologist to do these blocks. Okay. Uh, along the way, I was fortunate enough to find a mentor who taught me how to do these blocks. And now I do them autonomously. I teach them to my students. I teach them to other anesthetists. Um, uh, the technology has just exploded. Uh, back in the day when I was a new anesthetist, we used to um, uh, have the non-invasive blood pressure cup that blows itself up. We only had a couple of them in the department. 
uh, if you didn't get there early enough to get this non-invasive cup, you were doing manual blood pressures with an earpiece in your ear every three, four minutes. Um, we, we didn't have that live time feedback. Uh, we now have something called a BIS monitor. You put it on the patient's head and it gives you a, uh, a, an EEG. It takes an EEG from all different parts of the brain and uh, changes it into a whole number. And we always shoot for 45 to 60 because we know that number is within a deep hypnotic state. Um, there's, there's that change. Uh, the profession itself has moved from just basic, you know, intubation, general anesthesia to now a uh, full scope of practice. Everything an anesthesiologist does, we do as well. So that's, that's been the biggest difference. You also mentioned about how you ask tough questions about their mistakes, just things that people not necessarily expect. Um, and it really does show through their grit, resilience, things like that. That really reflects for interviews in general. Um, so as a program director, when you ask those questions, what type of answers do you find the most success with as students? Honesty. Don't make stuff up. If I ask you about the last mistake you made and you say, well, I don't make mistakes, I'm going to tell you that I made about three today that I can think of. I mean, we all make mistakes. We're human. And, and it's just... Um, it's the, the, the hallmark of, a, of an emotionally intelligent person is someone that's introspective and can say, well, you know, I, I made a medication error uh, when I was a new RN in, in the intensive care unit. And this is what happened. And this is how I dealt with it. Or, you know, um, I may ask, uh, did you ever have a deadline that you missed? Why did you miss it? Um, and, and did you did you ever do what you needed to do to meet the uh, requirements of that deadline? Or um, things like, uh, how do you, what do you, what do you think your first failure will be in this program? You know, and people are like, whoa, that's, you know, they're not expecting those kind of questions. They're expecting to come in there and sell themselves. But now I'm, I'm asking you to look at yourself and say, you tell me about the bad stuff. I'm reading all the good stuff on your, on your application and all your recommendations. I want to hear about the bad. And what are we going to do about the bad? Or how are you going to cope with that? Yeah, it's definitely not something that people would expect at all. And um, I think they're, like you said, their true colors come out because of that. If you, you don't know the answer to a question too, sometimes I'll ask clinical questions. Like I'll say, I'll say something like, uh, tell me about your last very difficult patient. And they'll, you know, talk about it and they'll say, well, and then they were on, you know, we placed them on a, on a uh, leave a fed drip. And I'm like, Oh, leave a fed. Tell me about that. What is that? What's it? What's the generic name or what's the typical dose range or what, what, what receptors does that, uh, you know, stimulate or what do I see physiologically? Don't, don't make it up. If you don't know, just say, you know, I'm not clear on that. Or it's, it's better to say, I don't know, I'm not clear than, you know, making something up. Cause I know what LevaFed does. So um, just be honest. Yeah. Another thing uh, we wanted to ask is about practicing in different areas. So you mentioned the Midwest, California, Florida, um, having different numbers of programs, but like let's take an example between Connecticut and rural areas in the Midwest. What's the comparison between practicing there? I think you're gonna find uh, most of the practices in Connecticut are what's called medically directed models where we work in sync with anesthesiologists and there may be one anesthesiologist overseeing three operating rooms where CRNAs are giving anesthesia to three separate patients. Uh, when you get into the Midwest, you're either working without a, an, an anesthesiologist anywhere uh, as a uh, solo practitioner, or you may be in a group of CRNAs only if you're in a very rural area, or um, you could also be in a model where the uh, there's one anesthesiologist uh, and it's not medically directed, but they are there um, uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the actual nomenclature for it. Um, uh, there is an MD there. Certain hospitals want an MD there as well, but they're not necessarily overseeing what you're doing. You're working autonomously. They're just kind of in the background. So um, 
the more rural you get, the more autonomous you are, uh, the more procedures you get to do. For instance, we don't do a lot of peripheral nerve blocks uh, at Yellow Haven Hospital because there is an actual block team of anesthesiologists specifically trained to do those. Um, just to push the point home even further, uh, only those anesthesiologists do those peripheral nerve blocks. Even the other anesthesiologists that work with us don't do them as well because they weren't specifically trained. Now that's kind of that's kind of a little bit of a different scenario. You'll find most hospitals allow the anesthesiologists to do all the blocks, but there are hospitals in Connecticut that allow CRNAs that are proficient and want to do them uh, to do peripheral nerve blocks. So that's usually when you get to the coastal regions, uh, the Carolinas, uh, New York City, um, California, you get a lot more interaction with MDs. As you get more into the rural areas, you don't find a lot of MDs around. Uh, it's more CRNA only, if that makes sense. Yeah. Another question we wanted to ask, and you kind of touched on this earlier, um, what are some specific experiences or challenges that were brought up with the pandemic? We know that with specialties in general, they faced a lot of um, transitions, adjustments during the pandemic. It was very redefining. So for nurse anesthesia, what did that look like? Uh, well, at Yale New Haven Hospital specifically, we were very fortunate. Our management is uh, wonderful in that every one of us, and there's 140 of us, uh, found a place they canceled. Remember, they canceled all elective surgeries. So other than emergency surgeries, the operating room was relatively closed. And so they found us all positions as advanced practice providers in the intensive care units. We were setting up intensive care units in our recovery room uh, because we were so overwhelmed with patients on ventilators. We were uh, running uh, ventilators from our anesthesia machines because we ran out of ventilators. Um, we had anesthetists working in call centers. We had them working, uh, those that didn't want to come in or were pregnant were working from home as APPs. Uh, so they found uh, places for all of us. Some of the private practices furloughed their anesthetists because there was nothing for them to do. Um, we, we've, we heard about that as well. A lot of anesthetists got in their car and went to New York City. Uh, the hospitals in New York City were just clamoring uh, for people, for anyone that would help. Uh, so they went as 1099s uh, and signed on contracts. Uh, I had my, my good friend, Kalen, he went around with his, uh, he had a butterfly ultrasound and uh, started uh, peripheral IVs, A lines, central lines, just that's all he did uh, because these patients were so sick and, and these practitioners uh, couldn't access lines, even the simplest of IVs on them. So um, it was it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing. In terms of the school, it was very difficult. I learned very quickly how to teach coursework uh, and how to give anesthesia virtually. Uh, our students were pulled out of the operating rooms for about 10 weeks. Um, so it was a very, uh, very tumultuous situation. Uh, we all made it through. I'm gratified to say all those students got all their case numbers uh, by graduation. And that particular class passed the uh, national certification exam. 100% of them passed first time. So, yeah, that's great to hear. We can wrap up with one more question in terms of, and we touched a little more, um, a little about practice. But when you have the case of like, let's say difficult cases of a difficult intubation, what are the steps that you would usually take to reroute and uh, troubleshoot? The American Association of Anesthesiologists has something called the difficult airway algorithm. And it's a really kind of cool thing because um, it, it says that either A, oh, I see you, uh, you're definitely a difficult intubation because you've got halo traction on and a C-spine collar and you only open your mouth that, that, that much. I'm gonna prepare you for awake intubation. And I go through the steps to do that. Um, it's a very particular stepwise thing that you do to intubate someone uh, awake, uh, which can be very frightening and it can be uncomfortable for them. So you need to uh, sedate them somewhat, somewhat, but you can't have them stop breathing, obviously, because uh, now you're in a pickle. 
the more interesting difficult intubation comes in when you ex ass ass assess the patient and you say, oh, you look like a pre pretty easy intubation. And you get them into the operating room. You put them off to sleep. Uh, you're able to mask, bag, ventilate them. But you go to do laryngoscopy and you take a look and you're like, whoa, I have no idea what's going on here. I, I can't see anything. I can't see landmarks. This is crazy. I didn't expect this. All of my assays uh, to figure out whether or not you're going to be a tough intubation. I, I, you looked pretty easy to me. Uh, as long as you can bag mask ventilate, all right, like almost with that AMBU bag, like you see EMTs using it. We have an AMBU bag on the machine with the face mask. As long as you can breathe for the patient, you've got all the time in the world. We have lots of new toys out there. We have different uh, intubating scopes. We have something called the glide scope, which has a more, the, the blade that goes in the mouth has a much more acute angle. Uh, and really, um, I won't say it's foolproof, but it, I think has really changed the face of difficult intubation. Um, there's lots of different methods we can use. We can use a, a tiny bougie uh, to get it through the vocal cords and then put a tube in over it and put it in. Uh, a lot of different things we can do. The trouble comes when I cannot intubate and I can no longer bag mask ventilate either. That's a cannot intubate, cannot ventilate situation. And that's when we go for the um, first, uh, what's known as a superglottic airway a laryngeal mask airway, something that'll go in above the cords to establish the airway. Last but not least, if that doesn't work, and that does work about 85% of the time, when it doesn't work, we have to do a cricothyrotomy. But that's that's basically your difficult algorithm, uh, airway algorithm in a nutshell. All right, well, I think we'll wrap up today's session there. Thank you again so much, Dr. Cosgrove, for joining in. We really are very excited, first of all, for the session. And um, hearing the insights about nurse anesthesia. It's the first time we had a session over it. It's very, very exciting to hear. I'm sure not only I, but a lot of other people have gained an appreciation and admiration for the profession. For those who are listening to our shadowers, to earn your credit for attendance, you must pass the quiz to receive the certificate. That quiz is now posted in the chat box. It's also available on our website under the virtual shadowing page. The quiz will be due next week on Wednesday, July 20th at 1159 p.m. Central Standard Time. After passing that quiz, your certificate will be sent out to the inbox of the email address you list. But if you don't find that certificate, feel free to just check your spam folder or send us an email to ask. For our next shadowing session, be sure to catch us with Dr. Sims um, this Saturday, actually, uh, for um, OB Joyen. It's going to be at 7 p.m. Central, as always, Saturday, July, July 16th, in this case. And like I said earlier, Follow us on Instagram to keep an eye on our flyers. You can also join our listserv to do the same. But with that all out of the way, I want to thank Dr. Cosgrove again for taking time to join us today. We really do appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks so much, Michael.